I've entitled this morning's sermon, Paul's Prayer Life. Prayer is a fascinating topic in the Christian uh, faith. I have uh, in other places and other communities taught on prayer for uh, eight or ten weeks. It's theology, it's types, there are numerous great books uh, written on prayer. But prayer can get a bad rap sometimes. How many times have... um, How many times have you said, uh, what else can I do for you besides pray? As if there was anything more important that you could do for someone than pray for them. Or perhaps you said, well, I know I can pray, but what else is there? Or perhaps... uh, You've heard it said, I need to contact our prayer warriors to pray about that, as if only um, certain people can effectively pray. What happens to us when we think that we're seriously about praying about something and nothing happens. Does prayer change people or circumstances? Well, we could go on and on about questions surrounding prayer, but I want us to look at our passage this morning as it kind of gives us a little bit of light, a little bit of of insight into the prayer life of the Apostle Paul as he is opening, we're still in the opening of his letter uh, to the church at Rome, a letter that as I've said he, he's written um, but a church to a church he's never visited. Uh, this is a church that was formed uh, probably out of uh, the, the people who were at Pentecost and who came back to Rome and started house churches Uh, It's full of Jews, it's full of Gentiles. Um, No apostle has ever shown up there. And yet Paul decides that he must write, and as we'll see, is wanting to go. So let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's Word. We believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice. And I'll begin in... Verse 8 of chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of His Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Father, we pray that you would uh, not only bless the reading and hearing here, But, Father, I pray we would see no man save Christ alone, for it's in His name we would ask it. Amen. Be seated. There were a number of different directions I thought about going for 
this sermon this morning. And the first thing that really struck me as I began to sit and study and contemplate and pray on this passage was verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus, through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. The faith of the church at Rome is so well known that people who come and visit Rome and then perhaps leave and go elsewhere talk about the faith that they see in the church there. It is to such a degree that it is the first thing often that seems to be talked about. And so before we get to the Apostles Paul's prayer life, let me simply ask this question this morning. What's the first thing that people in our our community talk about when they talk about this church? What is something that immediately pops into mind when somebody talks about you? Is it your faith in Jesus Christ top of mind? Now, I kind of uh, really maybe don't want to admit this, but I'm going to tell you all that I love being out in the community Uh, Particularly if people don't know I'm the pastor of this church or at least don't know that I'm your pastor and they start talking about you guys, right? The little stories that I get, the little insight I get. And frankly, even sometimes when they know I'm your pastor, they feel compelled to tell me some story about you. Now, most of the time, that's really uh, an interesting time. And uh, oftentimes it's helpful to me to know how to be a better pastor pastor to you um, occasionally you know I hear something that you would be embarrassed about if you knew that I knew but that's okay but what is top of mind when people say okay Louisville Presbyterian Church what is the first thing that people out in our community think about Louisville Presbyterian Church is it that our faith is so well lived out that it we have a reputation As a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church. What about you? What is the first thing that comes to mind when somebody thinks of you? Is it what a good business person you are? What a good heart you have? (laughs) That you do something that occasionally you'd wish your pastor didn't know about? Or is it your faith in Jesus Christ? Do they say, oh, every time I think of whomever, what a faithful Christian they are. But, alas, our main focus this morning is on prayer and the prayer life of the Apostle Paul and the insight into some of the questions. So I'll just leave that with you this morning. What is your reputation in the community in terms of your walk with Jesus Christ? And is it top of mind when somebody thinks about you? Well, the prayer life of Paul that he mentions here, he mentions his consistent prayers, he mentions some prayers that have gone unanswered. And so I want to take some lessons that I find here in our passage about prayer and bring them out to you to show you this morning. The first lesson that I see here is that prayer and work for the kingdom go hand in hand. Prayer and work for the kingdom go hand in hand. Paul talks about praying and preaching. So often we think that we can either do or we can pray. But a strong prayer life, and as one commentator said, a vigorous and fervent service to God, go hand in hand. Should go, in fact, hand in hand. Now, it is true that some people... Um, are incapacitated. Some people cannot get out. We have a list, in fact, on our bulletin of shut-ins. Uh, it is true that some people, uh, either 
because of, of health reasons or some other uh, reason can't actively participate and decide in that time to turn their their service to Jesus over to an incredible prayer life. Praying for others and praying for the Lord's work here, even though they can't participate perhaps as much as they would like in the work here. That is true, and there are those that do that. But I am talking about those of us who can do. It should never be do or pray. We should be men and women of strong prayer lives, but active participants in the kingdom. Nobody was busier with work for the kingdom of God than was Paul, and yet he consistently carried out a strong prayer life. He consistently, it says here, prays for these people in Rome. Robert Haldane has said this, prayer and labor ought to go together. And how true that is. As Jim Boyce also noted, prayer directs that service. So if you're active in the church, but you're not praying, perhaps you're not being as effective as you could. And if you're praying without acting, you're only lifting up half the call of Christ on your life. Being on fire and active for the Lord should always be guided by a strong prayer life. The best way to direct, in fact, your heart for service is to have a really strong prayer life. Prayer makes that effective. It helps to direct us in our kingdom work. It keeps us centered in God's will. Now verses 10 through 13 here um, give us uh, a sense of, um, of what we're, we're, we're seeing in terms of coming face to face with several things in Paul's prayer life. Perhaps some things that haunt your prayer life and haunt my own prayer life. Paul says that he longs, in fact, he has prayed to come to the church at Rome that he might bless them, that they might be mutually encouraged. But it, it says that he has been prevented from doing that. Now, this is not the first time that Paul's been prevented of, from doing something that we would all say is a good thing. You remember from Acts 16, he was prevented from going into Asia to preach the gospel. So what are we to make of the fact that here the most active apostle to the Gentile world is told no in his prayer life? And incidentally, other times we can think of where Paul was told no is perhaps his first one that jumps off the page to me is his thorn in the flesh that he had prayed that it would be removed. Well, God answers prayer usually in one of three ways. He either says yes, he either says no, or sometimes he says not right now. So why does God answer no to what appears to be really solid spiritual request? Things that we think would be good for the kingdom. Things that he says no to that we feel like are worthy spiritual request. Now, I'm not talking about our Lord help me win the lottery kind of prayer request. I'm talking about things like bringing somebody to faith or healing someone or that you could be used for the kingdom some way, some particular way. Well, one writer has commented that the reason is 
we're not always necessary for the work of God's kingdom. Now let that sink in for a second. Sometimes he tells us no when we want to be involved in something because he's teaching us the lesson that his kingdom goes on with or without us. There will come a time when I will no longer be the pastor here. I hope that it's a long time in the future, but there will come a time and this church will go on. This church has existed for hundreds of years without me being here. So I'm not necessary to the work of the kingdom of God except for the period of time when God has put me here. You may be thinking, oh, I need to do this or that for the kingdom of God. And God says, no, he continually shuts that door. And he is perhaps teaching you that you are not necessary for that ministry work. You see, we have to sometimes watch ourselves and decide if we are praying this kind of thing out of pride. I want to be the one in front of the room. Or what exactly is the motivation of our... Now, let me quickly add that this is not your get-out-of-jail-free card to keep you from doing anything in the kingdom of God. How many times have you heard, God's not calling me to do that? When you haven't really spent any time searching the very heart of God to see if you should do it. Just because it's outside your comfort zone does not mean that God's not calling you to do that. He doesn't call you just to do what's inside your comfort zone. But sometimes he does say no. Perhaps God has something else in mind for you to do. Perhaps you think you want to go over here, but God needs you over here, and so he shuts this door and he tells you no so that he might direct you over here to something else. Just as a quick aside, does prayer change circumstances or does prayer change people? The answer to that is yes. Now, most often God changes us in prayer but he has also ordained you can see this in James chapter 4 he has ordained prayer as a means to change circumstances but most often our circumstances change when prayer has changed us inside fervent open honest prayer causes you to surrender yourself to Jesus Christ Paul had this vibrant prayer life in the midst of his busy schedule. So let me give you just a couple of things here as we draw to a close. A few of the reasons God might be saying no to your prayer request. Prayer needs to change us, as I said, before it can really change our circumstances but there are certain things that the Bible points out are reasons why God says no to your prayer request. The first one is unrepentant sin. You can go to Isaiah uh, 59 for that. When we have unrepentant sin in our lives, God often withholds the answer to our prayers. The second thing that I see in Scripture that helps us understand why God often says no is that we ask with wrong motives. We can go to James chapter 4, verse 3 for this. This is common amongst Christians. We pray for our will to be done, not God's will to be done. We pray from the wrong, oftentimes, sometimes selfish motives. The third reason I see in Scripture as to why God sometimes answers no is that we are 
lazy in our prayer lives. Pure and simple. We pray if we get around to it, if we think about it, or we often pray when we're in trouble, right? When things are going great, not so much. Let the tide turn, oh Jesus, right? What does it mean to have an earnest prayer life like Elijah had? If you look at James chapter 5, it talks about how Elijah earnestly prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't for three and a half years. We're not serious about prayer. How many have wept during your prayer time? How many of you go to your knees in humility before God in your prayer time? Leading right into the fourth reason that I see we're too busy to pray. I've told many times the story of Luther who said, on good days I pray for two hours, but on really busy days when i got war, more to do than I'll ever accomplish, I pray for four hours. What does your prayer life look like? Do, do hours even enter into the conversation? Or is it more... Minutes, even seconds. The fifth reason we see from Ezekiel 14, idols. We pray for what would make us happy. We pray for what we want. We manufacture these things and then think that God is the ATM that we can go to in prayer. Uh, the sixth one, and quickly, is <laughs> stinginess in giving. Let that sink in for a minute. We see that in Proverbs 21 and in Luke uh, chapter 6. Stinginess in giving. We want from God, but we really don't want to give back to Him. And lastly, just object unbelief. How many of us have prayed for something that we really had no confidence God would answer? James chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, speak to this. Let me leave you with this question. When you don't get the answer you want, you've examined yourself and confessed your sins, you feel like you're praying within the will of God as you can understand it from Scripture, God has not convicted you that this prayer is outside of His will, how long is long enough before you quit? How long do you pray for something when the door is shut, when the answer is no? How long do you keep praying for that request? Jesus answers that, doesn't he? <clears throat> In Luke 18, he gives us a parable, and we don't have time to read it this morning, about the woman who persists. <coughs> excuse me, who persistently goes before the judge. Finally, it says, look, the judge is going to give her justice, not because she deserves it, but because she's tired of her, her nagging him. Well, God is not like that. We do not nag God. He is generous and wants to provide good and profitable things for us. And yet, we need to stay persistent. George Mueller, great Christian leader of an orphanage, who built his entire orphanage, I would add, off of prayer, uh, never asked for money. <clears throat> Some days he would pray in the morning, and the money just to get through that day would arrive during the day. Mueller had three unconverted pagan friends that he prayed for, for 60 years, every single day, until he died. Now, two of these eventually came 
to faith in Jesus Christ. One came to faith in Christ at his very last meeting that he conducted after, or service that he conducted after he had been praying for 60 years for this particular individual. The third one came to Christ after Mueller died. How often, how long is long enough? Until God changes you or changes the circumstances. Prayer, consistent prayer. Never give up. Never, never, never. But allow prayer to shape you. And in shaping you will change your circumstances. Pray that you would be made into the man or woman that God would want you to be. Amen.